Let's start off. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss things. Now, I work for a company called ThoughtWorks. We're a, a bit like Trifork, actually. We're sort of an ally of Trifork, um, based out of Chicago originally, but now all around the world. Um, and over the years, we've, well, about the last 10, well, almost 13 years now, we've been publishing something called the ThoughtWorks Technology Radar. And I thought as a start, starting point for this talk, it might be interesting to take a quick look back sort of 10 years to, to think about where we were in terms of technology sort of 10 years ago. What were we doing? How were we working at the time, right? Now, back in 2011, this is the first time that Android appeared on the tech radar. That's 12 years ago. Android. The Android was new only 12 years ago, right? Git, not GitHub, Git, and Mercurial, whatever happened to Mercurial, Git was new 12 years ago or so, right? Similarly, AWS first appeared on the tech radar in 2011. Um, ThoughtWorks were the first training partner for Amazon Web Services. I was number four in the world for the AWS of AWS trainers. Amazon didn't want to do it themselves at the time. They could see no future in any form of training or certification for Amazon Web Services. So they entered into a partnership with us to do it. Uh, turns out, um, yeah, that became a thing. And after a couple of years, uh, we stopped being the trainers for Amazon. Um, but hey. Just after that, about two, yeah, about sort of 2011, back end of 2011, continuous delivery made its first appearance on the technology radar. So this is when we first started to think about how to put build pipelines together, how to think systematically, if you like, about the flow of work, how to think systematically about how we build our software and how we promote it progressively through more testable environment, more test environments through into production. Um, we then had a little bit later, microservices appeared. So 2012, microservices first appeared on the radar. I did a talk uh, in QCon San Francisco in 2012. Um, Jez Humble uh, asked me to do a half-day workshop on something called microservices. So I put a half-day workshop together, and then about three days before, he said, oh, can you make it a full day, please? Um, which was a bit awkward. So I spent an entire weekend in a hotel room in San Francisco, not doing anything other than writing slides frantically. I then did a microservices uh, training course for, for a day. And at, at the lunchtime, the, during lunch, uh, someone came over and said, I'm really glad you've been talking about hypermedia, because I sit next to Roy Fielding in work, and he really bangs on about it all the time. Uh, apparently I got it right, so that's good. I was happy. Uh, this is the obligatory, uh, this is what microservices used to be uh, back in 2011, 2012. Um, hexagonal business capabilities, rewrite rather than maintain, blah, 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 blah. From the talk Java, the Unix way, which is still available. Um, this is the obligatory standing on the shoulders of giants slide. Um, all the stuff that I've sort of done over the years has been based on previous people's work. My skill is not to invent stuff, it's to collect stuff together, right? It's to sort of analyze and see patterns and bring things together. Um, and that's what microservices is, really. It's standing on the shoulders of people like Jim Weber and Ian Robinson from Rest in Practice fame. It's Gregor Hopper. It's, um, it's Dan North. It's Adrian Cockroft. It's Fred George. It's all these people who had all these ideas that I sort of managed to corral and write up with Martin Fowler. So I have to put that up there because it's non none of it is mine, so you can't blame me now, right? Don't blame me for microservices. But back in 2012 or so, when we put that on the radar, it seemed to lead to this explosion in new ways of doing stuff, new ways of working, right? Um, and you can actually look in 2012, before that, some of the things that you could that led into microservices. So continuous delivery, um, evolutionary architecture, emergent design, build pipelines, polyglot development, uh, down the bottom, we had things like simple techniques for performance testing. We had smaller, simpler, faster applications and services. So really what we were seeing is a trend towards this idea of building smaller, simpler applications. Um, you could argue that the applications themselves are simple. Um, the complexity comes from, uh, stick it, from plugging them all together. But that's a conversation we can have over a beer tonight. And it's led to this sort of explosion, giant explosion in, um, by the way, did, was I hallucinating that a load of kids just turned up and then disappeared again? That was cool. <laughs> um, very bizarre. Right. Um, so it led to this explosion in, in sort of tooling, in new techniques, in observability tooling, in things like chaos engineering, all this sort of stuff is super exciting. 
And that was back in 2012. We then had a bunch of other stuff turn up. Docker. Docker was new, well, first featured on our radar back in 2014. Right? So this is you know, not too long ago. Docker, again, taking over the world. We had Kubernetes appearing just afterwards, six months later. So Kubernetes had only been around since about 2015. Right? It's about, about eight years or so. We then had React. React turned up then. Um, this led to themes on our radar, such as things like um, excessive churn in the JavaScript world, and JavaScript world goes crazy, and led to lots of jokes around things like, you know, I don't know what uh, JavaScript MVC framework I should be using because I haven't checked Twitter this morning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But you know, React, React and its tooling only happened in about 2016 or so. Platform engineering teams, 2017, and then, you know, I don't know if you've come across this, uh, this, this joke before, but platform engineering teams, it's, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world is to sell a platform, right? Because every CIO now knows that they need a platform, right? So, you know, I want to have a platform, I need a platform. So I, I must have a platform. And then, of course, what happens later on? Um, okay, we've got a platform and we've got a DevOps, but nothing's changed, right? Um, yeah, that joke didn't go over as well as I was hoping, to be honest. But I'll move on. And then in the last sort of few years, we've got data mesh. So data mesh is the sort of, I like to think of it as the you know, data and um, the stuff that sort of sits underneath everything else, the kind of you know, data warehouses, data lakes, now data meshes. You know, this is the sort of last refuge of the tiered architecture, of the layered architecture. And data mesh is obviously an attempt to, um, to, do, to, to do for data what domain-driven design and product development and all these sort of nice things have been doing for, um, for, for the rest of our, uh, our software estate um, the last sort of 10 years. Um, I should point out that we meet every six months to put the radar together, every six months. And on average, we have about 300 new things to talk about every, every three months. We have 300 new items. And that doesn't include the fact that India, for example, only bring 40 new things to talk about when they were actually had four, over 400 at the last meeting suggested to them. So we, we, we distill a whole bunch of stuff down. And we still, every radar meeting, have 300 new things to talk about. Like the pace of change is astonishing, right? We can only look to chat GPT, as we heard it a minute ago, to see that. We can only look to the sort of new tooling that's available for us to do our job, um, to, to see that the pace of change is, is incredible. How do we keep abreast of it? I mean, and I put this obligatory countdown to the singularity slide in here. This is Kurzweil's idea that, you know, at some point in time, um, at some infinite point in time in the future, there will be a technological singularity, at which point something will happen. But it's okay because it's an infinite amount of time away, that's fine. So, you know, infinite time is, I mean, we won't get that, right? Because it's inf infinitely far away, so. I mean, if it was a finite time singularity, things would be very different. Finite time singularities mean that at a finite point in the future, we will have the singularity. I'll come to that later, it might scare you a bit. So, what does good look like in terms of software? We've, you know, Taking a quick look over some of the techniques, some of the things that um, the things that have sort of made waves in our industry over the last sort of ten years. What does good look like at the moment? What are the things that we do uh, typically uh, that we sort of consider good software engineering or you know, our craft? And the first thing is this idea of continuous delivery. Now, I mean, when this appeared back in 2012, we've been working on this, working this way in ThoughtWorks for a long time before that. In fact, um, Jez Humble, Dan North, and Sam Newman were the three monkeys of continuous delivery because they were all on the build team at AOL back in 2005 when I joined ThoughtWorks and our project there. And that's where a lot of these ideas came from, was ThoughtWorks projects. And then they were distilled by Dave Farley and Jez um, Shout out to Dave Farley as well on his YouTube channel, which is brilliant. Um, into this book, Continuous Delivery. You know, and this tells us how we can apply a systematic approach to building quality into shifting all the things left, I guess, as the CIOs amongst us would say. Um, and you know, it's become essentially a canonical way in which we go about thinking, or w in which we think about building software these days. I would argue that building microservices. Oh, go back one. <laughs> 
I would argue that building microservices, this is the second edition that Sam Newman writes, is another canonical description of how we often build software these days. I'm not suggesting we should all build microservices all the time, but it, it, the book lays out a, a set of techniques we can use if you need the set of uh, uh, properties that a microservice architecture can, can give you. And often we end up needing those things, right? Whether we think we do at the start or not. There was a great quote by someone I can't remember anymore from Google who said, you know, at the start you should design for 10 times um, your, your, your users, 10 times your load, and then when you get to 10 times, you should design for 100 times. Um, and that's what building microservices is, is about, really. It's about thinking about you know, what do we need in the future? How do we evolve our systems such that they can handle load or scale if we need to? But also it brings in a whole set of practices that are sort of, um, I guess, would I would argue, Again, canonical, things like domain-driven design features prominently in building microservices, the idea of bounded context, the idea of how you structure your software in a way uh, that allows you to change it easily, how you can replace software easily, how you make it more reliable, and so on and so on. Again, microservices, I think, is a whole set of practices, a bit like extreme programming, right? We pulled a bunch of stuff together and said, hey, why don't we do all of this all the time? And that's really what, what the idea of microservices is. And then more recently, we've got this book, by some more of my colleagues, um, Neil Ford, Rebecca Parsons, Pramod Sadalaj, and a former colleague, Pat Kwa, um, on evolutionary architecture, building evolutionary architectures. How do we actually uh, build, well, think about building software that is able to evolve over time and make that a first-class concern? Next up, there's this idea of product development, lean product development. I personally think that this book, Principles of Product Development Flow, is one of the, if not most, the most important book about what we do as software developers. Um, it talks to the economics of why what we do or how what we do works, if you like. So it talks to things like queuing theory. It talks to why is it um, that the, the team structures we find ourselves in in agile teams, why is it that, that they are more effective? Why is it that agile software development practices and program, or, um, sorry, product development is more effective than building waterfall, um, than, than running waterfall projects? Next up, Accelerate. So this is, again, a set of research. That's, that's, it's, it's the Dora uh, research summarized in a book called Accelerate. I hope people have come across this. Again, it's a canonical, um, canonical take on, uh, well, it's a, I always get this the wrong way around, qualitative, a set of qualitative research that um, shows why what we do using the other practices, why that works. And it's probably the most, it's probably the first time that that's actually been set down in paper. You probably have come across things like the full key metrics um, and the other, the other uh, uh, things that have come out of this book. Um, but Accelerate is, a, is, a, is an awesome, awesome book. And then finally, this idea of team topologies, which is super, super, well, I say new, it's probably about three, four years old now. Um, Matt, uh, Matt Skelton and Manuel Pace are sort of stalwart members of the London Continuous Delivery Community. And what they've done here is they've given us a vocabulary we can use to actually talk to each other about team structures, about optimizing for how we build software as, as communities, as teams, because generally building software is a team sport. I've sort of cut these into two sort of sections, really. There's the stuff we do that seems to work, right? We've sort of, you know, microservices seems to work. Building small bits of software that talk to one another seem to work. You know, continuous delivery seems to work. It seem, seems to get better results when we sort of, you know, make small changes, commit often, and push those changes through an automated build pipeline into production. That seems to work. And building evolutionary architectures, building software, you know, that, that can evolve over time, that seems to work as well. And then we've got, these other books, which are about how it works, right? It's about, you know, what, what are the principles? What are the, what are the you know, what, why or how do the things on the top work? Principles of product development flow, um, accelerate, and team topologies. It's a bit of a sidebar now. If you've come across this one as well, the books are over in a minute. It's going to come on to graphs and turtles. You'll be all right. It's fine. Graphs and turtles coming up. This is a great book by Dave Farley. He asked the question, are we actually now software engineers? You know, for a long time, we've called ourselves, or some people have called each other software engineers, um, and most other engineers have sort of looked at us and just laughed, frankly. I remember um, being at a, a go-to Chicago many years ago with um, 
uh, where the keynote was the evening ke evening keynote was delivered by uh, Dr. Anita Singupta, and it, she was at the time the principal investigator for the Curiosity rover, the, the bit that landed on Mars, right? So you know she did all the principal investigator for the parachutes and the retro rockets and all this really cool stuff. And at the end of her keynote, someone asked, you know. So what about redundancy? You know, what happens if something goes wrong? What redundancy or resilience did you build in to, uh, into the rover? And she literally just laughed at them. And she said, no, we don't, we don't do that because redundancy is weight, right? And any time you add more weight to a thing to get into space, like you in exponentially increase the price of getting into space. We like to use this little, this little thing we call at NASA engineering. Right, and everyone, it was basically a bunch of us in the audience, and we all went, oh, <laughs> right. Um, but Dave, in this book, he argues that actually this set of practices that we have now, they actually do point to a repeatable, practical set of tooling and practices that we can use um, to deliver software into production, to make our users say thank you, to deliver um, a flow of value that maybe does approach something that looks a bit like engineering, actual engineering. I mean, there are other practices as well. I thought I'd shout out to our sensible defaults. So these, this is the set of things that we expect our teams to be doing in ThoughtWorks. Um, you know, not, not every single time, but they're called sensible defaults because if you're not doing them, you better be able to tell me why you're not doing them, essentially, or explain at least why you're not doing them. And these are things like frequent and continuous integration, test-driven development, pair development, so pair programming, build security in, fast and verified automated build, automated deployment pipelines, early and continuous delivery, quality and debt effectively managed, and build for production. And if you're not doing those, I don't think you're, you're right. You, I don't think you can really call yourself, I'm, gonna be, I'm just going to go out there and say it, I don't think you can go out there and call yourself a professional, right? I think this is the thing, these are the set of things, along with the other things I've talked about, that mean that we are professional software developers. It's the discipline behind what we do, the discipline behind how we get stuff into production. So... As I said, yeah, we've got these, this set of books that talk about what we do, and then we've got a set of, set of practices around you know, kind of how we go about doing it. Um, but really, all of this stuff is about the optimization of our ability to make changes, right? the ability to get uh, working software into production safely and sustainably over time. It's essentially about our ability to optimize for flow. So now I'm going to ask you another question. Why does all this, why does all this stuff that we do work? Why does the stuff that we do that works work or something? Now, this is the bit with turtles. Now, bear with me. What does the Gantt chart for the Apollo program look like, do you think? I've got, a, I've got my, my version of the Gantt chart for the Apollo program here. Looks like this. First of all, we design the rocket. Right. Then we go and build the rocket. Then we launch the rocket, zoom through space, land on the moon. Then we come home and have tea and biscuits. I mean, they would have done if they weren't American. Anyone think that that's what the Gantt chart for the Apollo program looks like? Oh, go on. Just one person? No? I mentioned you know, Anita, um, Dr. Anita Singup for a minute ago and her, when she was talking about engineering. What she said, when she said, you know, we use this little thing called engineering, what she meant is that at NASA, before they get off the ground, before anything goes into space, everything is tested as much as possible on Earth, right? You want to de-risk a whole bunch of stuff here locally. So you build computer simulations, right? You do things like build scale models. You drive mini rovers around the, you know, the, the desert in, the, in, the, in New Mexico or whatever it is. That's what engineering looks like, right? De-risking things at the point where you can de-risk things rather than spending lots of money on super, super risky things that could go wrong. And that's why the, the Gantt chart didn't look like this for the Apollo program, right? The Gantt chart for the Apollo program looked like a whole, bunch of a whole bunch of missions, things like Gemini and Pathfinder, all these other missions, which were designed to de-risk the actual going to the moon bit, right? Yeah, so Pathfinder, for example, one of the programs, I think it was Pathfinder, basically shot rockets like arrows at the moon and hoped to hit it, 
that was that was you know that's literally can we hit the moon with a rocket because we didn't know at the time as the human race right so you de-risk stuff in an iterative and incremental way uh, using the, the simplest most cheap least risky ways of doing things that you can that's what nasa does and i think we can learn from that now i talked about turtles there's a thing called generative science Generative science is a sort of a type of science where what you do is you, you create a model of the world, a simulation of the world, and then you run that model. And if the model agrees with the real world, that's cool. You can then ask questions of the model. This is this idea of generative science, right? And there's a whole bunch of tooling around generative science, often using something called agent-based models. Now, who's come across Logo? Yay, got a few few hands going up. So Logo is a is a tool to build agent-based models. It's a programming language. In fact, it's a horrible, horrible programming language. Um, but it's a, it's a it's programming language to build agent-based models. Agent-based models give us the ability to simulate the real world in some senses, or at least simulate properties of the real world in a constrained environment, the computer that, that, that Logo is running on. Now, there's a, a next generation of Logo called Net Logo. Um, and NetLogo is kind of interesting because uh, in NetLogo you can do all sorts of interesting agent-based models to simulate all sorts of interesting things. So this is flocking behavior in birds, right? So uh, if I press play, over time what we should see is you've got all these little agents and they're interacting, you know, they're basically interacting with one another or not. And over time you get this behavior which appears to approximate how birds flock or fishes in the sea, for example. All right. um, and sim interestingly, this model can be created using really simple set of parameters. Essentially, how close they, 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 they can get to one another, these little agents, how fast they turn, how the, the angle that they can see in front of them. Really simple parameters. And from these really simple parameters, you get this interesting kind of flocking behavior. This is another example of an agent-based model that's used. This is a simple version of vir viral infections using NetLogo. So what you can see on here is over time, people have been infected based on movements, based on distance, and based on a few other parameters as well. Now, I appreciate that these are really, really simple models. Um, but using these models allows us to actually ask questions deep questions about the real world. Now, during COVID, um, I presume people, you know, I, I don't know what it was like in Denmark, but in the UK, we had this two meter rule. We, you know, you're not, you can't get within two meters of someone. You have to wear masks, you, all this and that, right? Now, a lot of that was done using agent-based models. A lot of the simulation, a lot of the modeling work was done using this technology, right? But much more sophisticated versions than NetLogo, mainly because refactoring and testing NetLogo is a nightmare. There's no modularity or anything like, anything like that, so you want something else. But a lot of this stuff was done using agent-based models. This is, uh, a, this is a, a paper that we, that we co-authored with an Indian university on a Rust-based epidemiological framework, which ended up being used in India to simulate and model COVID propagation, so the spread of COVID in, in India. Um, and again, using really simple parameters or sets of parameters, how close you can get, you get to one another, you basically program the, program the simulation, run it, see if it agrees with the real world, you know, is the spread of infection as we see in the real world, Right? And if it, if it is, cool, we can ask the model questions. What happens if, you know, people, what happens if the agents stay two meters apart? What happens if it's one meter apart? And that's where a lot of these sort of rules that we had came from during COVID, is using these sorts of simulations of the real world. Um, this is another example, Bharat Sim, open source collaborative project um, between Ashoka University, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can actually see there's a, on the right-hand side, this is running for they are a very large sort of population. Effie Rust and Bharat Sim, they get up to the hundreds of millions of agents that they can simulate, right? So if you're in India, there's a lot of people. You need to be able to simulate large, large populations. Um, these are kind of interesting tools that we can use to you know, explore, explore the world, explore the world of work, explore the, world, the real world, and as I'll come to you, the world of work. This is another example. I think this is fascinating. Are you on here? I'm not sure if Denmark's on there. No, so um, again, using agent-based models, <laughs> this, this paper is essentially a complete refutation of the idea that trickle-down economics works. It's, it's amazing. Mathematically, it just doesn't work, right? If you take a bunch of agents and they each have something they can exchange that's valuable at the start of a simulation, right? And you run the simulation, at the end of it, every single time, one agent ends up with everything, 
and all the other agents end up with nothing. Every single time, more or less, within error. Yeah, it's, 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 that's, that's the thing. So what they then did, once they've established that, is say, well, what happens if we add market controls? Right? What happens if we add interesting stuff around you? Know, the, what, is, what is the economy, what, what does the market look like in the UK? What does it look like in Denmark? Right? And so they added market controls into the model, into the simulation, and they were able to reproduce the Gini coefficients for each of these countries. They popped out. So you know, the, the different types of control economic control that our governments impose directly lead to, in these simulations, the, the discrepancy between rich and poor, essentially. It's kind of fascinating what you can get out of these kind of models, these simulations. Um, I'm going to take a step back a minute now um, and say, you know, general AI is here now. This is a quote from Charles Stross. He says, general AI is here now, it's just that we work in them. We call them all companies, right? We work in general AIs. Uh, and they're called companies, and we just operate their algorithms very, very slowly. Right? That's, uh, none of this machine learning chat GPT stuff, we should be looking at the places we work. They seem to have a life of their own, right? They seem to propagate, they seem to die, they seem to split, they seem to merge over time, right? much like life does, much like humans do, right? much like mammals do. Um, now, this is uh, an example of a slice through the informational hierarchy of a company that I worked at with ThoughtWorks. It's an organization, it's a big retailer, it's about 170 or so years old. What we can, I don't know what we can see in here, but on, this is essentially a value stream map showing what happens from an idea being created on this side of the map to software being put into production on this side of the map this side of the value stream map. There's a tiny, I can't really, I would skip down there, but I can't, so my laser is not working. Yes, it is. Um, that little blue square there, that's, soft, that's developers writing code. Everything else in that is stuff around developers writing code, right? There's a bit of testing going on, and so on. But what I've called out on here, there's a bunch of interesting things that we see in organizations, um, a bunch of sort of structures that we sort of, sort of put in place in organizations because we think they're going to be useful. Um, as I say, this is a, a slice through the informational hierarchy of an organization. Um, some of the things we sort of see in these, in these value stream maps when you put them together is the different types of way people, people work together, right? How teams interact, how different... Um, types of role interact. And typically they interact in a number of ways. You either have coordination, so you'll, you'll, you and another team have to do something to get some work done together. You have scheduling, so I have to wait for something to happen before I can do my job. Say I'm waiting for a change request board, or I'm waiting for the architecture review board. And we have queues, JIRA essentially. We have backlogs of work that has to, has to be done. Right? And these things together essentially make up how information flows, how values throws flows through our organization or in a lot of cases in this or in this organization doesn't flow because it's kind of you can see how long this is right it's, this is like a year's worth of work to get from one end to the other of this so these are different types of ways that teams operate right now when we talk about things like um, things like team topologies and the book team topologies why is it that team topologies has become so successful well it's because it gives us a vocabulary to describe better ways of doing stuff other than this right when they say value stream aligned team in team topologies this isn't what they're talking about they're not talking about this giant value stream like this what they're talking about is having a, a, a product team that's aligned to the value delivered to the customer right directly to the customer not this giant process of queues and scheduling and uh, wait times and blocking and all these different things. This, for example, oh, you go back one. This, for example, this is all the stuff you have to do in terms of testing. All right, so systems integration testing, um, integration testing, systems integration testing, user acceptance testing. Uh, I think there's other stuff like performance testing, regression testing, all these different things that have happened. And you know why they've happened? It's because over time, something bad went wrong. And so they went, right, we now need to do eight weeks of regression testing every time you make a change, right? We end up adding process, adding lots of sort of constraints into, our, into the way we work. Which is going to bring me to the first, uh, I guess, topic of, uh, that I mentioned in my abstract, which is around batch size. So 
one of the things that continuous delivery has shown us is that if we move small batches through our software delivery pipeline into production, essentially, we'll get faster. We'll go faster. And this is down to this thing, batch size queuing principle from, Donald Wright, from Reinison's Principles of Product Development Flow. The batch size queuing principle, reducing, reducing batch size reduces cycle time. We can actually see this on here. So this is a, a quick graph I put together. Um, so if you've got two large batches versus lots of very small batches, essentially you can work out the average cycle time uh, via Little's formula. And the average cycle time is way, way better with smaller batches. The best batch size you can have is a single piece of work moving through your system into production, right? Whereas if you've got, for example, a waterfall project, a well, waterfall project is 100% batch. So you know, every time, uh, uh, every time a, some work goes into a particular stage of your of your process, so you know, into analysis, everything has to be analysed before going into into development. Everything has to be developed before going into into testing. Um, whereas if you look at things like this single piece flow, this is why actually agile software development, lean product development, it works so well because we reduce batch size. We concentrate on reducing batch size. Batch size reduction can enable us to shorten cycle time, often by an order of magnitude or more, without changing capacity use, utilization. Right? So without working harder or adding more people to a team, just by reducing batch size, um, we can, if you half, half your batch size, you're going to double your throughput. It's as simple as that. Right? That's the simplest thing you can do to go faster, is, is, is reduce batch size. Now, Don Reinertsen, in, in this book, he talks about the effects of queues. Right? Queues are what create big batches, because stuff sits in queues for a long time and then gets sort of taken off in batches. And queues do all these things. They're not great. So the principle of con congestion collapse, this is another principle from Don, uh, Don's book. When loading becomes too high, we will see a sudden and catastrophic drop in output. So if you've ever been on a team where you've been asked to do multiple things at once, we're going to run multiple projects at the same time. I'm going to have to like switch cognitively between lots of different things. What this ends up doing is leading to this vicious cycle, which ends up being this idea of congestion collapse. We can see these things on motorways. Congestion collapse is best illustrated by what happens on motorways or roads with cars. Again, a bit of NetLogo for you. They're called turtles, the agents in NetLogo. That's why there's turtles in this. So what we can see here is a number of cars on a highway simulated by, uh, by agents in NetLogo. And you know, just by setting a, uh, like three parameters here, which is how, uh, how fast they accelerate and decelerate, and the number of cars on the highway, you get essentially what happens on motorways, on auto routes or whatever. Right? So you know when you're on a, on, a, on, a, on a motorway and suddenly everything stops, right? bunches up, all the cars bunch up in front of you, and you have to like slam on the brakes. And then you think, oh, there must be a crash or something, but there isn't. There's no crash. There's nothing, nothing happening at all. That's just because there are too many cars on the motorway. That's literally it. When you have too many cars, too much stuff going on for a system, in this case, the system of cars driving on the motorway, in our case, when, we, when, when we're working, um, you know, too much work to do, you end up in this, in this scenario where things grind to a halt. Don Reinerson says, paradoxically, what you end up with is, this, is, is a state where you're both incredibly highly utilized, often 100% utilized, so people are working flat out but nothing's actually happening, right? Nothing, no output is coming out. That's what happens here. It takes you a long, long time to get from A to B if there are too many cars on a motorway, this idea of congestion collapse. I mean, this is the equation that, that governs this. You can, you know, slash S, slash, et cetera, for um, what we do, the, the user stories per day or whatever it is, or user stories per week um, is equivalent to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the final thing I want to point out from, from this book is this idea of the peak throughput principle. Control occupancy to, to sustain high throughput in systems prone to congestion. Again, this is about what we do. This is about the underlying stuff about why what we see in our in our in our day to day lives, um, kind of why why that occurs. Um, control occupancy. So again, this is the the motorway again. What well, you can see, I've just changed the number of cars on the motorway. And over time, you get this convergence, so all the cars are able to go together at the right speed. What does that mean in terms of our work, what we do? Well, that means what we should do is constrain the amount of work that's been pushed into our teams. We shouldn't just pile on more work. We shouldn't just sort of say, oh, things are going slowly, so what we need to do is expedite a job through, because all these things will lead to something called congestion collapse. It's maths, right? And you can simulate it using these tools. <laughs>
brings me to this final bit. The second Q size control principle, don't control cycle time, control Q size. Now, I've no idea what lunch is going to be like here, so sorry, uh, go to organizers, if it looks anything like this. Um, but often at conferences, what you see um, is long queues for lunch, right? You see you know, one table, two tables, long, long, lots of people queuing for lunch. And if you went to the end, well, when someone had just finished their lunch, and you kind of said, well, how long did it take you to, to get your lunch? And they went, oh, it took me about 15 minutes. It was, it was awful. You know? um, oh, God, well, we, we need to put more tables out. You know? You're too late at that point if you're waiting until after the fact. But there are leading indicators of cycle time being blown. So lunch is served at one o'clock, right? We've got a bunch of hungry people. Uh, yeah, there's been a trickle of hungry people arriving because they haven't been at the last talk. And suddenly the talk's finished. Loads of people arrive at lunch. You get this massive increase in hungry people arriving at the, at the lunch table. But unfortunately, you can only service so many lunches at once. Only so many people can actually fit around the table to get their lunch, right? Which is this constant departure rate here. So the session's finished. Right now, the time between all the people arriving, and you've actually been able to tell at the end of it, in this case is like, you know, one minute 35. But actually, if you, if you look at how deep the queue gets at the start of lunch and measure that instead, you can actually tell in much, much shorter time um, that you've got a problem with lunch. In the same way that you can tell much, much shorter time if you've got a problem with your you know, how long things are going to take to get through your team. You don't need to work out what, how long it takes from a piece of work to get from one end to the other. You can just measure the queue size at the front, and that will tell you how long things are going to take and, and whether uh, you need to take action. It's interesting stuff. Um, by the way, original slide from our AWS training course. Um, <laughs> great partner momentum. Oracle are on board, awesome, right? Um, but why is AWS a thing? AWS is a thing, I think, because they got this. They got the fact that actually what, what AWS does is provide self-service access to infrastructure, right? They take away the idea of having to hand someone a ticket to say, can you go and get my lunch for me, please? Instead, you just do it yourself. You make your own lunch, if you like. And that's what platforms do. Platforms, and self-service platforms in particular, Self-service platforms invert the relationship between producer and consumer, essentially. So essentially, you know, if I want infrastructure, I can just start it up. I don't have to ask anyone to do it for me. The people I'm asking don't need to scale their team depending on the number of requests. Right? That's why AWS is a thing. That's why AWS has worked. But we aren't just machines in a factory. So I'll talk a little bit about complex adaptive systems. The fun thing about complex adaptive systems is that they can be described, and we are complex adaptive systems. All of us are. Mammals, cities are complex adaptive systems, teams are complex adaptive systems, the organizations in which we work are also complex adaptive systems. And they can be described using these three ideas. Space filling fractal networks, either small world or, um, or hierarchical, so either a social network or a hierarchical network. Invariant terminating units, so people in organizations, cells in mammals, and so on, and then feedback, so you know, feedback from market forces or evolution. And depending on the different type of network you get, either hierarchies or small world, you get different types of effect. So hierarchical fractal space filling networks leads to an interesting property, which is something called sublinear scaling. So whenever you see hierarchies, uh, you, 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 you end up with a property of various things called sublinear scaling. Um, so, for example, as you double the size of a company, the company doesn't double the amount of revenue. It scales sublinearly, so you get about 85% of the revenue. As you double the size of a city, you don't double uh, the, the amount of infrastructure that you have to have in the city. You get, need about 85%. Similarly, as you double the size of a mammal, you only need about 85% of the calories, and that's because all these things exhibit hierarchical space-filling fractal networks, so circulatory systems, network cables, water pipes, and so on. But there's another type of, uh, of, of, of fractal network, which is the small world social networks, and they exhibit something called superlinear scaling. Now, superlinear scaling means that you get more out than you think you should. So instead of like, when you double one number getting less than double, when you double one number, you get more than double of the other. Another quick interlude, back to the radar. 
So we heard about you know, ChatGPT during the intro. Um, we first had that on the radar, actually, this edition. For, fortunately, we didn't miss it completely. Um, but up to that, we had a whole bunch of other stuff around, um, around data. So we had Ernie and Bert and so on, mainstream of ML, meteoric rise of practical ML, a whole bunch of tooling around this, including domain-specific large language machines and so on. And in fact, our chief scientist, Martin Fowler, he wrote this. Uh, he wrote up a conversation he'd had with um, Hu Zhao, who's our head of tech in China, on using LLM prompting for programming. So basically using, um, using it as a sort of pair, if you like, using ChatGPT as a pair. Now, the thing is, there's lots of horror stories out there at the moment, right? Kent Beck, he said this thing, what was it? He tweeted, uh, I've been reluctant to try chat GPT, blah, blah, blah. And he realized that the value of 90% of my skills just dropped to zero. And the leverage for the remaining 10% went up a lot. So he's sort of talking about how he can, you know, as, a, as a professional software developer, you know, how he's going to have to relearn a whole bunch of stuff. And actually, the stuff he does do um, that has value is going to be much more valuable, which is what we heard a minute ago. But then this is from this week in the UK. BT to axe up to 55,000 jobs by 2030 as it pushes into AI. Um, so British Telecom, they've announced that they're going to Basically, they think 55,000 jobs are going to go globally, which is you know, because they're going to be using AI to do a bunch of stuff. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But certainly, there's a lot of horror stories out there. There's a lot of kind of FUD right, about AI and about machine learning. I'm not going to say AI, about machine learning. <laughs> there you go, just ML, about ML and LLMs in particular. Um, and uh, it reminded me when I was putting this together about a super interesting um, conversation I had with someone who's a futurist, futurologist, is that a word? And they were talking about how innovation inevitably leads to you know, job creation and how it's always great for, the, you know, great for humanity and so on. And he sort of said, you know, look, you know, you, there's so many jobs were created when the automobile was invented. You know? He sort of said, you know, you've got this amazing increase in the number of automobiles. And there was someone else in the conversation who said, yeah, but what happens to the horses right, that were replaced? It turns out the horses disappeared in, in America when, 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 when the automobile was, uh, was invented. So there's no guarantee that the thing that we invent is actually going to generate like, more jobs. It's going to be, each innovation is going to generate like, you know, worth for humanity, if you like. But I would argue, based on complexity science, um, based on this idea of... Uh, returns to scale, which is sort of super linear scaling, that ge generative AI is one of the things that's going to actually save the world. But not for the reasons you might think. So von Neumann, this has been remembered by Standard's Law Ulam uh, later on, but after his death. Uh, but von Neumann said, the ever accel accelerating progress of technology and changes in the mode of human life gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race, beyond which human affairs, as we know them, could not continue. He was quite a wise, wise old bird, was, uh, was von Neumann, as well as coming up with the Monte Carlo technique and a whole bunch of other, well, the computers we use and all that stuff. He also predicted the onset of the singularity. Now, going back to Kurzweil's singularity, right? I mentioned at the time, Kurzweil's singularity is based on linear scaling. He predicts that at some infinite point in the future, we're going to have a technological singularity, right? Because it's based on this idea of linear growth, of exponential growth, essentially, linear on a log-log graph. Now, the problem is, as I say, log-log graphs, log-log, if you've got exponential growth on a on a, on a log log graph, you, you get a straight line. This is why it's called linear scaling. And you get a singularity as t tends to infinity, approaches infinity. But of course, time will never get to infinity, so therefore the singularity will never actually get there, will never arrive. But if you've got something called superlinear scaling, which a lot of the socio-technical structures or socio-economic structures that we live in exhibit, cities for one, organizations and so on, right? but specifically cities, cities scale super linearly. Super linearly. Any time you see a small world fractal network, essentially, you get this idea of super linear scaling. Right? And the problem with super linear scaling is you get something called a finite time singularity, as I mentioned at the start. So as opposed to Kurzweil's, at some point in the future, things are going to go crazy, 
the human race has built structures, socioeconomic structures, that at a definite point in time, there's going to be a singularity. In fact, this paper, which is very, very well cited, or which is cited a lot, predicts that in 2052, plus or minus 10 years, we're going to hit a singularity. And the reason for that is kind of interesting. It's because, essentially, superlinear scaling caused by small world fractal networks means that the socio-technical, the socio-economic structures we live in and work in are growing so fast that at, in 2052, we won't be able to produce enough energy for them to continue. There's going to be a collapse around 2042 to 2062 purely because we can't sustain the energy input Right, the energy into those things, into cities and so on. Right, that's a bit scary, isn't it? Even scarier, what the theory predicts is that post that, there's going to be something called a uh, post singularity collapse. Now, no one knows what that looks like really, or what happens in the post singularity collapse. The research is kind of a bit like we don't think it's good, essentially, right? But at some point, there's going to be a post singularity collapse. We're not only living at, on an accelerating treadmill that's always getting faster and faster, but at some stage we have to jump onto another treadmill that is accelerating even faster, et cetera, et cetera, even faster, et cetera, et cetera, faster and faster, 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 faster. Essentially, the only way to stop this singularity is essentially to innovate. That's what's been happening over the last 100, 200, 3, 4, 500 years, is we've out-innovated the, the, the finite time singularity, essentially. So we need to keep innovating. We need to keep, as a human race, doing this. So what do they look like? Is it quantum computing? Is it machine learning? Is it cold light fusion? Who knows? But all we do know is we need to keep embracing change. We need to keep innovating. Otherwise, amongst all the dangers of technology adoption, maybe the real question is whether we can afford not to adopt this new technology. Now, finally, I'm going to get on to what I really want to talk about. I did say there were other curiosities. <laughs> how work works. The curious domain model of how we work. So I just have used NetLogo to show a few examples of interesting simulations that we can use to approximate real-world behavior in simple systems and some complex systems. But based on a bunch of this research that's kind of pretty much at the forefront now, I mean, this is bleeding edge, I have to say, you know, complex adaptive systems, things like generative AI, generative science, things like queuing theory, can we use this stuff to simulate the real world, to simulate us and what we do? And I think the answer is yes. Maybe we can. So this is a recently published paper two weeks ago by Google Research in conjunction with Stanford, um, which is it's titled uh, Generative Agents, Interactive Simulcro of Human Behavior. So they created a little computer game using agent-based models, not NetLogo this time. But they built a little computer game based on a Dungeons and Dragons town. And what they found is these agents that they, they programmed to have particular types of behavior, um, they also hooked them up to a large language model. So when the agent sort of you know, woke up in the morning kind of thing, woke up in the morning, um, and interacted with another agent, they would converse. And they would do things like learn skills from each other. They would do things like organize to go to parties. They would do and, and spread the information and then self-organize to have a party and so on, based on agent-based models and large language models, generative AI and generative science. That's kind of interesting. There's an example here. Um, you can't exactly see this, but it's highlighted down the bottom. Uh, this, this particular person, th their current action is waking up and com uh, completing their normal morning routine, their location, and their current conversations. They're not talking to anyone at the moment. There's these little things wandering around, interacting with one another, um, simulating, essentially, real life. Oh, there you go. And I think we can use the same set of techniques to simulate the world of work. So if we take these ideas to things like coordination, scheduling, and cues, we can build agent-based models that simulate, essentially, the interactions of people in organizations, how we work, the teams we work on, the software we write, right? how we go about building software, how we go about putting software through a build pipeline. We can simulate all this stuff. Interesting, this is part of what the domain model for how it works looks like. You know, we've got people, machines, we're well, not kind of machines, but we kind of are machines, we're learning machines. 
We've got enterprise architects, and enterprise architects, they take stuff and turn it into other stuff. That's all we do every day. We take information, refine it, turn it into other forms of information until eventually that software pops, some software pops out the other side. This is literally all we do, and we can simulate this in software using things like behavior trees which is a way that computer games program NPCs. It's a basically a, a finite state machine represented as a graph. So using FSMs, or behavior trees, using the main model, which is essentially people turning things into other things and communicating via LLMs. This is a behavior tree implementation. We can actually build simulations for how work works. And this is one of them. This is a team of people who are working on some software, they're building some software, they're picking up user stories, they're working on them. These are agents in the, at the top, and as they're kind of progressively building, you know, developing software, or testing software, and deploying software, we end up with something that we can measure, which is valuable. So I think we can actually simulate what we do in the real world in software, and then we can use this to de-risk the interesting things, or the interesting decisions that we have to take in our day-to-day -day lives, in work, right? I'm a consultant, I often get asked things like, you know, hey, you know, we want to restructure this department, what should it look like? I don't know, right? But the problem is, I have a guess, I've got a bunch of experience, we have a guess, and that affects 100 people's lives, right? That's pretty grim, if you're wrong. But using tools like this, simulations of the real world, we can actually run this stuff in simulation form and de-risk a lot of these, uh, these really difficult questions. I did promise you that batch size reduction can help. Uh, you'll go away thinking about batch size reduction. Um, I'll, let me run this again. Because this is a comparison between Agile and Waterfall projects using the simulation, where Agile project is single piece flow and the Waterfall project is 100% batches. And the difference in lead times is quite a lot. And the difference in value is massive. That's why you should reduce batch size. So anyway, that's my take on how work works. I'm going to finish up there. And uh, I hope that's been interesting. <laughs> if not, if it hasn't, sorry, that's just how my brain works. <laughs> but thanks very much for inviting me. And uh, have, a, have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.